The title of our sermon is The Jesus Way. As you know, we've been teaching the Jesus Way, uh, different Jesus ways over the last year. Um, the, 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 the subtitle is Trampling on Snakes and Scorpions. Um, so we are going to start in Luke chapter 10. This is kind of the, the heart and soul of our message. And uh, this is in the New Living Translation, chapter 17, or verses 17 to 20. <clears throat> when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. So how do you like that? Jesus gave his disciples, we happen to be some of those disciples, he gave them authority over all of the power of the enemy. That's you, and that's me. Jesus gave us authority over all the power of the enemy. There is no, no power that Satan or his demonic horde has that you don't have more of. In fact, in the, it, we'll get into it probably the next time we speak, what kind of power he has, and it's very limited. But, uh, but regardless of that, every one of us, every single one of us who is a child of God has been given this authority. And it's, it's interesting, he said, I'm giving you authority over the power of the enemy. You're going to walk among snakes and scorpions, and you're going to do what to them? You're going to crush them? The title of the message comes from a different version of the Bible where he uses the word trample them. And it says, and nothing will injure you. And we'll talk about that maybe next next time we preach also. We ended up, you know, we, we talk, we visit, I rewrite our notes, we talk again, we rewrite the notes, and we ended up with so much, I think it stretched into a two-week message. <laughs> and we got the message for the next time after that. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> the Lord is good. So, so we just want to go through, we're going to go through, I think, the hows and the, let me see here, the hows the who's and the, and the why's today, and then the what's will be probably follow that. So how did we come across this authority? How, do we, how is it that we have this authority? And I think it's really important that we start there so that we see the underlying foundation of the authority that Jesus has given us to live in and to minister to others in. Because the authority is for two things that I can see. We'll get into that more a little bit later. But it's really for our benefit, and it's for the benefit of the nations. That's why he gave us the authority. And he told the disciples they had this authority after they had gone out and ministered in his name to many others, and they saw wonderful results. So this authority, from the very beginning, we need to understand, actually... It really is rooted in what he said to the disciples at the very end of this verse here. He said, don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. This authority is rooted in heaven. And it's rooted in our identity as children of God. That's where the authority is rooted, is in your identity. And your identity comes from heaven. Right? Let me say it again. Your identity and your destiny both come from heaven. They were not determined by your education. They were not determined by your childhood years, your family, your background. They are not determined by your ethnicity, the color of your skin, or the nation that you grew up in. Your identity and your destiny were formed and determined in heaven. And it begins with you being a child of God. And we got just a couple of scriptures that speak to this. And uh, we're going to look at Galatians 4.6 and Ephesians 2.6. We'll probably take a pause in between them. But 
These are scriptures you know, but we just want to reinforce this truth because this is the core foundation of everything that we do for Jesus and, and, in, his, and in our lives with Jesus. So, <clears throat> Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Our identity is rooted in our, in our intimate relationship with the Father. He calls us children. He calls us sons. He calls us daughters. We call him Father. If we use the term Abba, then we're calling him Papa. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of intimacy. The Lord has always, everything that he has done... Every, everything that he did for redemption, the whole reason Jesus died was because the Father was looking to have intimate relationship with us. And he succeeded in doing that because Jesus bridged the gap so that we could again be joined in spirit and we could be joined in relationship with the Father. And out of our hearts, we can know that he loves us and we can call him Papa. And that's where your whole identity comes from is from the very fact that God is your Papa. What an amazing thing. Um, something I want you to understand about the name of Jesus, and I mean, we sang a very powerful song about that name. The name of Jesus for us is not just a trigger we use to get things done. The name of Jesus is not just a tool in our toolkit when we serve God. The name of Jesus was given to us. It is your name because you are in his family. When you are in a family, you take the family name. So the name of Jesus is not just a tool, it's who you are. It identifies you. I am a Jesus follower. Jesus is my brother. Jesus is my lover. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my Lord. Everything about my life can be summed up with my name, Jesus. And so when you're, when you're speaking in his name, when you're using his name for authority, when you're, de when you're commanding a demon to leave somebody in the name of Jesus... It's not just your tool or your trigger. It's, it's your very identity. It's him in you that you're calling on. You see, it's more than, it's more than just, it's not just functional. Amen. It's relational, this name that he's given us. And it's a, so it makes it even more valuable and precious. And it really makes it so we want to use it in the right way, of course, too. Okay, let's try Ephesians 2. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Everything that we have is, is, begins and comes from those heavenly realms. See, that's what, when Jesus came and he said, the kingdom of God is near. We've talked about this before. There's two ways you could maybe translate near. One is it's soon to come. But I don't think that's what he was saying. The other way is geographically, it's saying it's close to you. And I think that's what Jesus was saying. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is near. Reach out and take a hold of it because it's right there for you. And you see, our identity, our life, our hope, our source is all in that kingdom that is here, that is near. When it, it's near, it's so close, you can reach out and take a hold of it. You can step into it and you can live there. That was his intent, is that we would come under his lordship, live under his reign, and in the goodness of everything that comes with his reign. His reign is his kingdom. Where he is ruling is where everything that is good about him happens. And we step into it by faith when we trust him. So if you've trusted Jesus, you've stepped into this place where all the goodness of God is available to be showered out on you every day of your life. That should get an amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> right? I like, I like the reaching out part. Reaching out for the kingdom. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah, it's right there. 
pull it in. It's not far away. It's not up there. It's in here. Holy Spirit lives in here. You don't have to call down Holy Spirit from heaven. He's here all the time. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk, let's talk about the who. Who did Jesus give us authority over? Number one, he didn't give us authority over God. But sometimes when I listen to people pray, I wonder if they're confused about that. <laughs> right? <laughs> you ever hear people pray and it's like they're telling God what to do? Right. Yes. You should tell your story. I do. She's got the greatest story. <laughs> my seventh grandchild was being born and I would be at the birth. So my daughter called. It was her third child. And she said, Mom, I, I got to go. And so... It was them driving their car, me driving my car, and we're racing down the freeway, okay? And we're both going the same way, so I don't know if I'm going to see them or not. It doesn't matter. I'm just saying to God, you keep that baby in till we get to the hospital. In Jesus' name, I'm telling him that. Very, like, I don't know. Passionately. I'm, passionately, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those people that's arms were flailing in the car, and I was talking, and people would be like, what is she doing? You know? So anyway, we had to pull over, and the baby was born on the freeway. Okay? It was beautiful birth. Beautiful. Okay? And the police come, the fire trucks come. We, the baby had already been born. And then they took... Amber and Ren and Ben along to the hospital to just make sure everything was good and I was following behind them and now I was exclaiming to God how smart he was and how much he knew and what a blessing that was to, to deliver a baby like we were by ourselves delivering a baby and that was just the best thing and I was telling him how he knew you know like he knew the whole time what he was going to do, and it was just beautiful. Yeah. Yep. So she, she told God what to do, and he didn't listen. <laughs> yeah. Number two, Jesus didn't give us authority over people. He didn't give you permission to tell everybody else in your life what to do. And the way I hear some people talk, seems like they're confused about that. <laughs> we spend so much time worrying about what everybody else should do. I mean, and we have some basic responsibilities. You know, we need to guide our children. So children need to be instructed, and sometimes they need to be told what to do. But that's your responsibility if you're a parent. Uh, sometimes we think it's our job to tell everybody else's kids what to do. Maybe not so much. Or to tell other parents how they should take care of their kids. Probably not so much. Or to tell unbelievers what they should believe. Uh, probably not the way that a lot of us want to do it. You see, the, the authority that we have isn't supposed to be used to coerce people to believe. It's not supposed to be used to coerce people to behave. Right. It's not our job, not your job, to get everybody to behave. Yes. It's your job to love them. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they'll take care of the behavior piece. And if all you do is scold them and tell them what they're doing wrong, they're never going to fall in love with Jesus. Because <clears throat> they're because they're too busy being mad at you. <laughs> How many people in our world are mad at God right now because it was a, because of the way the church has treated them? But we've talked about that a lot. We don't have to be, beat that. It's a dead horse, but it's real. It's real. Okay, so we don't have authority over God. We don't have authority over people. <clears throat> Oh, I have a great scripture for the authority over God piece. Let's go to Matthew 8, 9, because this is a good thought. I, I kind of like this when the Lord gave it to me. 
<clears throat> it's on page two at the top. I know this because I am under authority. Hold on one second. This is the centurion talking to Jesus. He wanted Jesus to come heal a servant. Jesus said, I'll go to your house right now. And then this is what the centurion said. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers. And I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. Yeah. And so everything that, all the authority that we carry, and when we see responses to our commands, and we'll talk about those commands, <clears throat> then uh, it, it happens not because we are such authority figures ourselves. The reason we carry the authority is because we're under the Father's authority. See, And so it just flows. It follows. It follows us because we're his children and we're his servants and he's called us. So, <clears throat> okay. Let's go to, back to Luke 10, 19. Oh, Cheryl, you're going to say something about this whole thing about the authority that he gives us. Yeah, I just want to <clears throat> say that I have felt like it's God honoring me when he allows me to pray for people, to use authority, to use it in my daily life, to use it in my own life. It's just such an honor to have that power to keep things in check and to serve others on behalf of Jesus and to follow that as a responsibility from him to do. It's like another obedience way of serving him. And I just feel such honor when I operate in that. Yeah. Yeah, when you, of course, when you get to, when you get to do the things Jesus called you to do, you realize there's, there's nothing better in life. You know, that, that's what we're here for. That's what we live for, you know. And uh, I remember, you know, going out and doing street ministry. I remember I had one time, I had the greatest conversation with this guy who was very antagonistic at first, and we really formed a relationship and ended really with a really positive conversation down on Lake in Chicago in Minneapolis, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and he left, and we got done, and I said, Lord, I said, if I could do this every day, I would give up golf. <laughs> That's back when I was golfing. I gave it up anyways, but not for the, not because of the kingdom. <laughs> Just because I wasn't any good. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so let's go back to Luke 19. I, I, want, I want to read again verse 19 of Luke 10, or Luke 10 verse 19, uh, what Jesus said to his disciples. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Can you all picture that? Who did, who did he say? I saw Satan fall Satan. from heaven okay. yeah. like lightning. <clears throat> yep. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. So, the truth is, the authority God gave you was not over humans, it was over spiritual beings who are active and busy in this world. And their primary purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. And there's nothing they love better than to oppress beings who are made in the image of God. They love to oppress God's children, and they love to impress all those who are called to be God's children, which covers the whole human race. That's their mission. They live to oppress, and they do it very well. And we see a whole world living in oppression because of the existence of this enemy and his horde, right? <clears throat> and then we come along in our authority... And we mess it all up. And that is big. That is big. 
Okay, how about Ephesians 6, 12? There's another one. These are familiar scriptures, but I just want to make sure we have a biblical foundation for this. So. For we're not fighting <clears throat> against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There's an unseen world. I mean, it's, and I've heard it's more real than this. Right. You know, <clears throat> right. It's, it's real. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was quite a long time ago. There was a, a real serious conflict in Serbia, Croatia, probably, oh my goodness, could be as long as 30 years ago now. Um, but the U.S. was considering getting involved in that fracas. And, uh, and I went to a, a gathering of pastors and intercessors about that time, and I remember uh, there was a, an intercessor who I really respected who was doing some instructing at that thing, and he, and, he meant, and, he, and, he, and he talked about the Serbian conflict, Serbian coalition. He said, he said, he said unfortunately, he said, what the government doesn't understand is that these are ancient, ancient battles that are rooted in demonic principalities. And this stuff has been going on for hundreds of years between these specific groups of people. And behind the warfare are principalities. He said, and, and so if you get involved in that, you, you, you know, it's not something new and it's not something that's physical. It's spiritual. It's rooted in the spiritual. You see, so, 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 so many times, even like, <clears throat> and, and, uh, and uh, obviously in, 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 this, in this world of nations, there, there is spiritual and there is physical, right? And somehow they, they, they work together, they're joined together, you know. It's impossible in, 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 in among nations when one nation chooses to be an aggressor it, then if they choose to be aggressive, say as Russia, as Putin did with Ukraine, Ukraine has two, you know, Zelensky has two choices. He can, he can mobilize his army or he can become Russia. So, so it, it's really not God's choice that we would have war, but unfortunately in this fallen world we do. But behind these powers, behind Putin, there are other things that are at work that we don't see. And if we ask the Holy Spirit to give us understanding, he can show us how to pray. And when we pray, we're not just praying against Putin. See, we're praying against something behind this. Um, I don't know if any of you remember, this is quite some years ago, um, oftentimes uh, Pastor Brian will sing a song from, um, that Don Potter wrote from back in Morningstar days. Rick Joyner was the pastor back then. And, and Rick Joyner wrote a book called The Final Quest. Anybody familiar with that book? And, and in that book, Rick, it basically it's a dream. I forget if it's a dream or a vision that he had. It was a pretty powerful experience he had. And he, and he wrote it all down. And, and he was climbing a mountain. Um, but and, and it's been a long time since I read it, so it's a little bit vague. But, but the point is, while they were seeking to climb, ascend this mountain, they were being attacked. And, and, and so these, 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 these demons were attacking them and they were shooting arrows at them. But the, but the amazing thing about it is that the demons were riding mounts and the mounts were human beings. So, so all of the onslaught of these demonic hordes against against Rick and all these believers that were ascending this mountain were demonic, but they were carried by humans. And so much of the political and, and social and moral warfare that we experience in our culture today is, is it's not, it, I'm not saying that people who think different than us are demon-possessed, but all of us are under the can easily be under the influence of and the oppression of, of spiritual forces. We all of us experience that. And, and so 
you, we have to remember that even in political and social and moral issues, our enemy, you see, our enemy is not people. We're fighting against a spiritual enemy that's seeking to destroy this world because God loves it. And he hates God. He wants to destroy everything God loves. And so he will turn everything backwards that God made good. And we see it happening. But it's because of his influence. So if we're, if we, if we're, if we're, if we're angry and name-calling and arguing with people, we're fighting the wrong battle. We begin to, we've been given authority over the snakes and the scorpions. People are not the snakes and the scorpions. See, people are oppressed by the snakes and the scorpions. And it's our job to help them be unoppressed. And one of the greatest ways that we'll do that is to exercise our authority in their behalf. You see? Sure. We get to do that for people. I'm so excited. This morning I woke up and I was like, okay, what day is today? What do I have to do? And, and it's like, oh yeah, we get to preach today. And then I said, Lord, help me. And so as I'm getting ready, the Lord <clears throat> brought to my mind a story when I was a child. And uh, <clears throat> I grew up on a farm. When I was four <clears throat> years old, we got an Arabian horse. So when... My dad put me on the horse. He said to me, now I want you to remember one thing when you're riding this horse. And I'm like, what? And he said, you're the boss. You're the boss of the horse. And I'm like, what? I'm the boss of this big thing? You know, how can I, how can I do that? He says, you don't need to kick it or slap it or anything like that. He says, just inside, you need to know that you are the boss. And the horse will sense that. Now think of that in the realm of thinking of who you are and what you have in Christ. And how we walk around on this earth. Like we know that we're, so to speak, the boss against the enemy in people's lives. I love thinking that... I'm like the FBI for God. And I'm like against the enemy. And I'm going to get him, you know. Yep. But that story to me about my horse was, was very powerful in the rest of my life. And it just so fits into the scriptures and how we walk in life to set the captives free. When she wakes up, the devil says, boy, she's up. Watch your back. Yeah, that's how I want to be. That's how we want to be. That's how we are. That's who we are. <clears throat> so let's, that just feeds really well into the whole, the whole why issue. Why did he give us this authority? And we're going to go to, back to Luke 9. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. To proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Uh, up higher, not the one in yellow. Uh, oh, the spirit of the Lord is on no, me. No, up higher. No, I, okay. Then when Jesus called the twelve together, yes. he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Yeah. This is what Jesus sent his disciples to do. Drive out demons, cure diseases, proclaim the kingdom, and heal the sick. That would be us. That would be us. And not only did he call us to do it, but he gave us authority to do it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So... Uh, the next one that Cheryl started to read is, is Jesus' mission statement, which is very important for us to understand as we reach into the lives of people, okay? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind 
to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is Jesus' mission statement. This is what he said he came for. He came to set people free. He, saved, he came to give blind people sight, not just physically blind, spiritually blind. He, wanted to, he came to open our eyes. He came to get us out of prison, not just physical prison, spiritual prison. So many of us are trapped in, in spiritual prisons of depression, spiritual prison, prisons of confusion, spiritual prison, prisons of lies that have caused us to, to go down a pathway that is destructive because we believe things that aren't true. In fact, that's the greatest, the only weapon that the devil has is the lie. Jesus said he's the, fa- he's the liar and the father of lies. That's the weapon that he uses. He gives us to believe things that aren't true. And when we do, it affects how we live. It affects how we think, how we talk, and how we live. Did I knock something over? Oh, okay. <laughs> you see, so... so That's our mission now, is to take the authority of Jesus and go do the same thing that he did. And actually, it begins with our life, because, you know, I I can't help everybody else if I'm stuck in a a prison of depression. But you see, the truth, and we're going to get more into this, there's so much to say about truth that we need a whole other session, because we're running out of time here. But, so, so in July, I think we speak on July 9th, It'll be a sequel to this, and we're going to talk a lot about how we wage the war, okay? Um, but, but let's just say this, that the truth is something that we need to learn how to apply to our own mind and our own heart, because the one thing that we will con- the enemy will constantly try to do is convince us of something that's not true that will diminish our joy, it will diminish our authority, and it will diminish the, the, the happiness that we carry in our lives, the meaning. It all goes away when we believe things that aren't true. And as I've said before, oftentimes we think the devil will come and speak to us and he'll pretend he's God. I find with me, he more often talks to me and tries to convince me that it's me that's talking. He disguises his voice as my voice. And of course, he won't... He won't ever hesitate to use somebody else to speak lies to you as well and tell you how worthless you are. And so the first place to employ the authority, of course, is in our own lives. To to determine that our identity comes from Jesus because he loves me and he loves me and he loves me and he loves me and he will never reject me. And he forgives me when I fail and he lifts me up and he keeps me going forward. He's called me. I have a reason to live. There is a purpose for my life. My life has meaning because I am a child of God and I am called by him. I have a destiny that he's given me. See, those things need to become real inside of us. They need to break down the lies that say you have no value, you have no ability, you might as well just curl up and die. But we have that authority, and he's given us the truth. He sent the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. So in Luke 9, 2, Jesus said, Proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I want to suggest something to you. Don't be shy about praying for your friends and family when they are sick. Don't be bashful about that. Oh, but what if nothing happens? Then nothing happens. But what if something does happen? What if you pray for somebody and something does happen? I think we can safely say that if you pray for your friends when they're sick or your family when they're sick, there's a better chance you'll see a miracle than if you don't. Chances are pretty good if we all start believing who we are and what we've been given and we care. Remember, we're not doing this to prove anything. We're not doing this to convince anybody. We're doing this because we love them. The same reason Jesus came and did it. 
Jesus came to redeem us because he loved us. We reach out into the lives of our family members and our friends and our work associates and maybe even a random stranger when the Holy Spirit prompts you because of love. And so it doesn't matter if... if, So I'll make a fool out of myself. So you get to be a fool for Jesus. (laughs) But maybe you won't be. See, I have, I have all kinds of friends and acquaintances who, who dared to pray for someone who was sick and saw work or so. I mean, I, I had one friend, he, had a, he worked in a shoe store, and his, his associate salesperson broke his leg. And he just, he said, can I pray for you? <laughs> you know, and the guy said, okay. <laughs> and he prayed for him, the guy's leg was healed. Whoa! Think that changed his life? Anyway, when you pray for people, the Spirit of God comes on them. Yes. And they feel the touch from Him. Yes. That's not nothing. Yes. That's something. We had had one family member who was once in a while would come to Hope, and she was visiting Hope, and Cheryl just went to greet her, stood behind her, rubbed her shoulders a bit, and began to pray over her. And she said, what are you doing? What's happening? And I'm like, it's the spirit of the Lord. Yeah. He loves you so much. Yeah. She was like, I'll take more of that. <laughs> See, peop- I mean, most people are not going to be angry that you offer to pray. A few, a few will. I offered to pray for a guy in a tobacco store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious, isn't it? Oh, I know. I, I had a I had a, a friend and uh he I was kind of his I was his guardian and he smoked and so I would help him manage his money and so I would go and try to find him cigarettes cheap, you know. And uh, so I so there was a store owned by an, an Islamic man. And he was struck, he was complaining about his back. And I said, well, I, can I pray for you? And he said, yes, but you can't pray in the name of Jesus. <laughs> so it made it pretty hard. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> what happened? Well, I tried to pray for him without using the name of Jesus, but I ended up thanking the Father. And he said, see? See? See, now you just talked about the Father. (laughs) So he didn't appreciate my prayer. (laughs) But that's okay. So what? You know, we we used to go, I I probably said this, we used to go that... You know, quite a few years ago now, when we were in the, the Toronto Blessing Revival days, we had meetings at an at a empty mall called the Apache Plaza. We called them the Catch the Fire meetings at the, at the Apache Plaza, or the Apache Plaza meetings. And a guy from Canada was a guest speaker. His name was Steve Hill. And, and every time he would, you know, he would speak, there'd be amazing worship, he'd speak. And then the rest of the night, we spent praying for each other. And, uh, and he, would always, he would always say, you know what? He said, if nothing else happens tonight, if nobody gets healed and nobody gets a miracle, he said, the one thing that's going to happen is that everybody's going to get loved on really, really well. And it happened every single night we went. People were praying for each other, loving each other, blessing each other, and miracles happened. So don't be afraid. I remember uh, Bill Johnson told a story, you know, they got a Bible school out there, it's a it's uh, Signs and Wonders Bible School, right? And so one of his, one of his students, this is, this is a long time ago he shared this story, but it, I've always remembered it. One of the students was shopping in Walmart one day, and he noticed that his hands were really hot. And he said to himself, he said, oh, this is the Holy Spirit. i got to find someone to pray for. So he, so he started walking around Walmart, stopping people to say, excuse me, sir, do you need prayer for anything? Excuse me, ma'am, do you need healing? And so finally he was, he was kind of at the front door and this guy was walking in. He said, excuse me, sir, do you need healing? And the guy looked at him and he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, well, what do you need healing for? He said, oh, I've got a horrible back. 
And the guy said, well, can I pray for you? And he said, sure. So he put his hot hands on the guy's back, and the guy was instantly healed. And so this kid didn't know any better, so he took the guy outside at the front of Walmart, and he put his arm around him. He says, ladies and gentlemen, this gentleman was just healed by Jesus Christ. And if you want to be healed, you can come here, and I'll pray for you too. <laughs> Let's catch a little fire. There's a little fire here in worship. The Lord is sending more fire. He's got more for us. He's got a whole world of nations, broken, oppressed, and needy people who need his love and his redemption. And we're the ones that are going to bring it. You're going to say something? Oh. Right? It's us. We're all he has. So Cheryl and I were listening to a message from our friend Bill the other day, and he, he, he asked this question, and so I'm stealing it from him. Uh, but uh, let's, just, let's just pose Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19 for this question, and that would be uh, on the bottom of the last page. <clears throat> then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you, always, to the very end of the age. Now, if Jesus gives us authority to act in his behalf, and he gives us a mandate to do something like make disciples of all nations, will it be accomplished if we fail to do it? is God just going to say oh I guess they're not going to get it done I'll take over or as Cheryl said is it a tremendous honor that he's chosen us to be his vessels of mercy on this earth and he gave us his authority and he mandated us to bring redemption to the nations and we're the ones who proclaim the kingdom of heaven and heal the sick. And if his church fails to do that, how will it get done? Or as Paul said, how shall they believe if they have not heard? And how shall they hear if they are not sent? It's us, guys. And it's a, it is, it's a huge privilege. And it's also very scary do it anyways. Isn't that what Brian talked about last week? Do it anyways. Dare to care. Dare to pray for people. Don't ever, ever let the devil tell you that your prayer is just a, a meager, paltry offering that doesn't have any value. I, I, learned, I, I learned this in one of my travels to Ukraine. Pastor Robert, Cheryl and I both had to say that. You know, Pastor Robert wears some really nice suits when he comes to church and preaches and stuff, you know. And, uh, but I only ever feel underdressed when he and Taqueras come dressed in their, their Africa garb. And then I kind of look at myself and it's like, I need one of those, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I haven't been to Congo, but I've been to Ukraine many times. And, and uh, you know, and back when I started going was shortly after, you know, uh, the, the Soviet Union fell, and I mean, you know, you couldn't even buy gas at the gas stations. They, people would be holding up gas cans along the side of the road, and you had to stop and buy your gas black market. You know, I mean, you couldn't get light bulbs. There's so much. I mean, nobody had money. Everybody was poor, and all these people would come to Pastor Gregory, who was the head pastor of the church, with these tremendous needs. They were losing their house. They didn't have groceries. This and that. And this and that. And, and, and he had no money. He had nothing he could do. He couldn't give them a... He didn't have a benevolence fund. I mean, all of his parishioners were poor. So he'd take him by the hands and he would pray his heart out for him. And I realized there was nothing 
greater he could have given them than to take them by the hands and agree with them in prayer for the blessing of the Father. And in a few short years, as I kept going back to Ukraine, I saw his church members begin to not just get jobs, but start businesses and begin to prosper and to begin to be able to help others because they were prospering. And it was God answering the prayers that faithful people prayed. When you pray for people that are suffering heartache and discouragement and who need help, if all you can do for them is pray for them, that is significant. And don't, don't, don't think, well, gee, nothing happened. Don't let the devil take you there. Believe what Jesus called you to and who you are in him, and let's change the world. Right? Right? That's our mandate. I mean, one person at a time will change the whole world. And start with your family. Yeah, good place to start. They're the hardest. And it's not too late to start. Like Never, like never. I, I still pray for my mom to see and hear because she is 93 and can't see or hear very well. And yeah. I still pray for healing. Yes, yeah, why stop? It's real. As Cheryl says all the time, God is real and he loves you. God is real and he loves you. Well, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you've done. It's kind of unnerving and it's also, it makes me feel a little guilty because I realize so much of my life I haven't, I haven't believed who I am or lived accordingly. But Lord, you're stirring fresh things in all of our lives here. You're calling us to a new season. And what you gave us is still very real. You've given us authority over all the powers of the enemy. And you've mandated us to use that authority in behalf of the people in our lives. So this morning, Father, we just say yes to you. We say yes to you. to step above our fear and our our sense of intimidation, our doubts, our what-ifs. And to dare to reach into the lives of those around us with love, with prayer, with faith. When we see oppression, to take authority over the strongholds behind it break the powers of darkness, can clear the spiritual air around the people we love, to open the door for Holy Spirit to begin to breathe on them and speak to them and draw them to the Father. That's who you are, God of redemption. And we're your ambassadors. We're the called ones. So we... We ask that you help us, Holy Spirit. Begin to stir new things in our hearts. Begin to teach us, open doors for us. Let us know when the door is open so we don't miss it. And help us to be faithful and courageous to step into opportunities that you give us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what you're doing. We yield to you and we trust you as we walk with you into it.